of not staying in your lane. And I do have some um, examples. You'd be surprised. Um, one of the, uh, one of my, I won't say my favorite things, but one of the things that nurses um, find interesting is when we get that newsletter in the mail and it talks from the state board and it talks about, you know, all the things and maybe some new laws that have changed. But on the last two pages, it has a whole list of people who have lost their license. So they've gotten, either they've lost it or they've been disciplined or something has happened. So um, we always look at that list to see if we know anybody on there, make sure our name's not on there, something crazy like that. My point is that lots of people lose their license every day all the time. And it may not be something that you readily hear about, but it's something that if you don't know anyone who has had a license issue, you have not been practicing a nursing for more than a year. Um, so careful, protect your, protect your license. Um, in fact, let me say another word about that. Um, CYA is one of the most important things that I can tell you. <clears throat> Please cover your ass all the time. I was uh, working in San Antonio. I've been working maybe a, um, I guess I had been working about two years. I was helping out with the disaster relief when we had all those hurricanes come through. That was the year after Katrina. And so, um, it was, it was rough, and, and you've got all these people, and you don't have the equipment. We were like holed up in some old TV bunker that they had shut down. I mean, it was crazy. So, so there are lots of workarounds that we had to do. I had a supervisor who, so I'm, I am supervising. I've got like these two pods and probably about 100 patients, 100 people in, pod, in these pods. And they're what we call walkie-talkie. So they're walking around, moving around, but they've got like, their oxygen, they're carrying their oxygen, they've got like all kinds of health problems, some of them are bedridden. Um, and so I, and I've got some assistant personnel working under me. And my supervisor, who's over the, the end, who's the night charge, basically, it was a night shift, um, told me to write a prescription for a narcotic, for a patient's um, medication who would run out, and the patient was becoming belligerent, and, and it was, it was um, creating a problem because it was, causing issues for us to do our work. Um, and, and he was keeping the patients up. Basically, he was a nuisance. Anyway, and he needed his pain medication. He was in pain, and he'd run out. Um, and so the supervisor tells me to, to write, the, write the script and call it in, and then we'll get the doctor to sign it when he comes in in the morning. He's like, that's what we usually do. It's regular, normal practice. Now. So I, what I said, I said, okay, now let me let me test the water. See, I said, well, you know, if that's the case, I'm really busy. Why don't you do it? No, 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 no. You do it. You do it. You do it. Well, now wait a minute. Now, if you don't want to do it, why is it I have to do it? If you if you really want it done that bad, you'll do it. Now he didn't do it, and then he wrote me up that next morning and said that I failed to do my duties in my job, um, and I had to go in and I talked, you know, had an issue and um, talked to the people, and of course they apologized because I stated my case and. Um, they ended up dismissing him. Now, he was the uh, one of the associate director's nephews, so there was a little nepotism in there. The point is, that's illegal. That's right. like a federal crime. Can I be, and just because we had the doctor's um, DEA number there, doesn't mean that I was supposed to use it. And as surely as he wrote me up for something that was clearly something I didn't do, um, he would have written me up for that federal crime um, and I would have been in jail, license lost, and I would have been another sad story that you didn't hear about. Um, CYA, all the time. <laughs> this is what you can't do. Don't do it. Um, administer bloods, anti-neoplastic agents, um, no art lines, no venous access devices, so, and, and no IV pushes. Um, so let me say that again. No blood products or cancer medications. No central lines, lines that go directly to basically an artery or the, the heart. That's not like a regular peripheral IV. And no IV pushes. So even if it is a regular peripheral IV, you shouldn't be pushing anything into it, like morphine. So maybe if there's some fluids hanging, you can, you can manage that, manage the rate that they're already on, but you shouldn't be pushing any medications. Okay, questions about that? So why is this important? Because the NCLEX will test you to see if you know how to stay in your lane. So they may give you a question, and the question has some great answers, and you're between two answer choices. And one of them, both of them are going to help the patient or what the patient needs. 
One of them is within your scope of practice and one of them is not. Can you identify which one is not in your scope of practice? So, we have a problem, we kill patients all the time, which is why we don't just turn the loose on patients and why there's like, um, what do you call it, um, now practice insurance. You definitely want to get some of that. Um, what, and what's covered by the hospital probably isn't enough because um, they're going to cover their own asses, not yours. Um, and then at that point you become a little bit of a, you do become a liability. We're trying to change the culture because, and this is part of changing the culture. Um, oh, okay, what happened? <laughs> oh Lord, are you serious? Uh, All right. We're going to keep moving. Y'all have the PowerPoint? Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, we were, um, we're trying to change the culture so that people will report their errors because people make mistakes all the time. And, um, and you're not invincible by any means. Um, so, I, I have made plenty of, not plenty of mistakes, but I have certainly made several mistakes and enough for me to learn to pay much closer attention in various ways. And I've also learned from other people's mistakes. Um, one big mistake that was publicized early on in my career was where um, nurses, a nurse accidentally put um, um, a tube feeding, so food that's supposed to go into your, through an NG tube into your stomach, um, through an IV, um, and it kills the patient. Um, wrong tube. Um, okay, so, so, we, so we were having all of these errors, lots of medication errors, lots of um, the, the root of administration, um, um, lots of nosocomial infections. What's a nosocomial infection? So hospital acquired, they came in, they didn't have one, they left, we gave it to them. So there's some various things that we can do to, well, the Institute of Medicine did a study and found out that there's some various things that we can do to prevent that. And they are patient-centered care. So um, instead of worrying about what that nurse said about your boyfriend yesterday and how she, you don't like her because she got a nasty attitude and you hate working on these days because of this, and your kids were acting up at home, and patient-centered. Like, we don't care what's going on in your house. You need to pay attention, or what's going on with the other nurses. Pay attention to the um, patient. Um, the uh, violence among nurses is problematic. We do it to ourselves. Um, it's also top-down. We have the same nurses eat their young. They don't have to, um, and it should start with you all, change. Um, so patient-centered care, teamwork and collaboration, another big one. Um, we need to talk to people, so documenting is really important because that is one of the ways that you communicate and also one of the ways that you CYA. Um, one of the biggest times that errors occur is during, well, when do you think? Night shift. Say that again? Oh, shift. Change of shift. Why? They're not documenting what they do. Ineffective communication. So ineffective communication because maybe documentation, because maybe they're rushing, because um, right, ready to go home, they're focusing on home, they're not focusing on the patient. So it needs to be, um, uh, or what's the word? Whenever there is a, a change of uh, care, whenever care is, um, given over to somebody else, there's a big risk for error. So change of shift, moving to a transferring to another unit. Um, what's another? Discharge. Yes, when they get discharged. Um, you're going home, we're kicking you out, your money's spent, we're, you're fine, you're good, you're not dying, you're ready to go. Um, we haven't reconciled their medication. We haven't made sure that they're going to get home care or somebody else is going to come in and check on them. Um, they'll be back in a week in the emergency department. Um, so uh, communication is really important. Um, do you all know what the word ethnocentric means? Ethnocentric. Like no judge something? It's like only your culture is like important. Yes. It's like a privileging of your culture, absolutely. Um, one of the things that I want to teach you all is to break down words because what you'll see on the NCLEX will be um, big words that you've never seen before and you're like, I have no clue what it means, but if you can break that word down, then it may help you kind of 
at least figure out what body system we're talking about, what, you know, what the general concept is. So ethnocentric, um, like you're centered on something. Your culture is the best. Um, but it's not, let me tell you, let me just tell you right now, it's not. Uh, my culture is the best. My own aerial culture, because I'm like multicultural. Um, the point is, um, we need to respect other people's cultures, and there is no, there's like this fallacy of uh, cultural competence like, you can never be competent in somebody else's culture because just because I look black and just because I was born in the South and just because I look like a female and just be, like, I have all these different experiences that make up my culture. So you can't just say, she's black, so I'm going to treat her this way and this is, this is what I know she expects. Um, you should ask me and I'll tell you. Um, so there is this thing of cultural sensitivity, which is the need to be sensitive to other people's preferences and ask them about it and try to accommodate them as best we can. You can say again? Oh, great, thanks. talk about technology, um, computer-based charting, that's important because it allows information to be readily exchanged. Um, so NCLEX questions around that may ask you um, about different ways to improve the safety of the patients. And you know that anything that includes communicating, collaborating, um, using technology to share information, being sensitive to the culture, that's the way that we increase safety. Focusing on the patient. So for example, any questions where the answer choices is focused on the nurse, you should just automatically know that those answer choices are wrong. So if it's like opinions, opinions of the nurse, we don't care what you think, I mean, not really. Um, we care about facts, um, objective and subjective data. Um, but we don't really care about your opinion. Um, so for example, if the answer choice is, um, the, the question is about a patient who is suffering from, I don't know, hypertension, and the spouse wants to know how the patient is doing. Um, and the two responses that you're between are the nurse says, um, oh yes, he's doing, um, he's doing much better today than he was yesterday. Or, his the other response pressure. is his blood pressure dropped by 20, his, his um, systolic blood pressure dropped by, by 20 millimeters of mercury overnight, um, which is the answer choice. Last one. Obviously the last one, right? Um, for one obvious reason, it's the more objective of the data, and we like more objective data. And the second is that that first one was an opinion. He's doing better today. That's in your opinion. Based off of what? Yeah, based off of what? Right, right. Based off of what? Like relative to what? Like okay, his blood pressure dropped, but he's still crabby. He still looks crazy. He's still throwing up. He's still like it doesn't look like he's doing better to me. Um, so no opinions. Um, okay, so there's some knowledge skills and attitudes that are expected of all nurses. Um, you can look up knowledge, skills, attitudes, and it will bring up a whole list and, and expectations around that. Um, they call them KSAs. Um, but on the next slide, you'll see that those are some of the attitudes that are um, expected. And on those attitudes, you build skills and, um, and, and your support, and you support that with knowledge. study? Uh, four hours. <laughs> Throw some numbers out there. 
Somebody said 24 hours a week. Wait a minute now. How many days a week? Six or seven? About seven divided by 24. We'll make that 20. We'll just say 21. That's what? Three hours a day? Three hours a day? Okay. So what? You get up in the morning and you know you have to be here in the morning. You go home and study from like what? Six to nine? No, that's good time. Space it out. Okay, you space it out. So what do you do? Like an hour here or 20 minutes here? How would you get off for lunch? Spend 30 minutes there? Maybe continuously? <laughs> well, if nursing is just your life, like when it has been there, you can't not. Right, it's 1 o'clock, right? Let me make a real quick study. We're here seven hours a day, five days a week. That's not five hours, that's not me. <laughs> All right, let's talk about um, curiosity. Yeah. Do you just study? What do you study? That's a better question. You should get interested in various topics. topics. So you definitely want to study a little bit of this, a little bit of that. You try to connect the concept. You try to connect the concept. Do that. That's it. Says he studies a little bit of this. He says he studies a little bit of that. I hear you. Could you? Uh, 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 hold on now. 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 Hold on now.
is required in order for us to do our job. And um, I study decision making, and I know nobody really wants any of us to have a uh, magnifying glass put to our decision making on a daily basis. Um, I know I don't necessarily want that. Um, and respect, because um, in order to receive it, you need to give it. And we should role model, because that, that's our job. Um, so, uh, that means we have to take care of ourselves since we are a role model and the self is what forms the basis for what we um, expect and teach of our patients and other people. And let me be careful about the word expect because um, we kind of used to do nursing and medicine. We still kind of do medicine from this um, biomedical, the word is um, hegemonic, or no, colonialist perspective, which basically means that colo um, um, co colonial, uh, what do you call it, the colonies. Basically, they came over, they said, you're doing it all wrong, they took, they took everything, they said, we're taking over, and we're going to make our colonies, and it's, it's ours. And it was yours, but we're making it ours, and you need to do what we say. Um, so that's like this colonial perspective where we tell patients, um, you need to do this, and if you don't, you're non-compliant. Well, it, it's not, you, they can do what they want. They're grown, they're human. I shouldn't say that because, um, you know, the kids. I'm a pediatric nurse also, and I, I have some feelings about the fact that you say just because you're an adult means that you get to do whatever you want. But at the end of the day, everybody has their own sense of agency. And what's important for us is to tell them what will happen if they, so if this, if you do this, then these are the consequences. And it's up to you to decide if those consequences are worth it or not. And for some people it is. And that's their culture, that's their judgment, and it's not for you to judge them on that. Um, so if smoking a cigarette in this instance is more important than my blood pressure in two weeks, um, I can tell you the cause and effect. Um, I can give you as much information and support if you want it. But at the end of the day, that's your decision, and it's your life. And, and who am I to say? Maybe you're right, because if you get run over by a car, you know, next week, then that blood pressure two weeks from now kind of is a mute point anyway. Um, so take your cigarette today then. I'm not advocating for cigarette smoking. What I'm advocating for is um, respect when it comes to other people's decisions. Because when you respect those decisions, they will listen to you. Um, and say, well, you know what, maybe there is another coping mechanism I can use in this instance other than cigarettes. There's nothing like going to somebody and being like, you need to stop smoking, because as soon as you are like, you need to, they're like, I don't know who you are, what you're talking about, you want to hear That's the polite, my husband and my mentor say the polite this, where people are like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm -hmm. yeah. And all in their mind, they're like, yeah, you, yeah, you know, all kinds of stuff I'm not allowed to say on camera. Um, <laughs> yes, so, and a lot of what we do is teaching. It's really important that we think about that when we get ready to teach a patient what they should or shouldn't be doing, what they need to do, especially when it's something that um, we know is, is, a, is a change in behavior. Because how easy is it for people to change their behavior? Think about your worst habit and think about what it would take for you to change that worst habit. Don't yell it out. We don't want to know the business like that now. Um, so you need to have all of these things in order to role model. You need to have physical health. If you go in there and your breath is funky and you literally sit down like you haven't showered in three days and your clothes are all wrinkled, um, that says something about how you take care of yourself. How are you going to teach me about my activities of daily living? Um, mental acuity. Keep it sharp. Keep it sharp. Um, there are lots of ways to bring it down. You know, everybody wants to get turned up, um, and then you got to get turned down. Don't come to work turned down. Don't come to work turned up either. Emotional stability. Times are stressful. You know, the kids are acting up at home. You know, the boyfriend ain't acting right. The girlfriend isn't acting right. The parents acting up. You know, whatever it is. School is hard. Um, it's stressful. But you can't take your stress out on the patients. Um, I know sometimes you want to, I can make some, shake a baby. I'm just kidding. No. <laughs> You've never been in a NICU with 50 screaming babies all at once for five hours. Like that will, that will um, do something to your psyche. Now, let me tell you something. That's real, which is why we tell new moms Support is good because you spend five hours in a room with 50 screaming babies that won't stop crying, and you need a break. 
and you need to recognize that you need a break and take one. Yes, otherwise you, you, you know. So, um, emotional stability is important, self-care is important. Professional boundaries. Um, there is a zone of helpfulness. We want to try to stay within that zone. So this, these are some testable things on the NCLEX. Um, what does it mean to be under-involved? So that's kind of like doing nothing. There are lots of questions where it's like, um, the uh, what's the best action by the nurse? Continue to monitor. Well, that's basically like doing nothing. Um, and sometimes you want to do nothing, but generally when we ask a question, there's a problem that we are trying to see if you recognize and know how to address. So usually we're not going to ask you a, a bunch of questions for you to do nothing. That defeats the purpose. Um, in practice, um, that's like not being avail available enough, emotionally available enough to, uh, to empathize with your patients. Um, you will see a lot of this when nurses are busy and rushing and, they're, and there isn't enough time and resources to do what they need to do. Um, the patient's in pain. I don't have time to deal with that. They need to just wait because I need to do whatever, 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 and I can't get to them in 30 minutes. Um, there is a, maybe you can't get to them in 30 minutes, but there is a different approach that you can take that will make the difference in terms of how they interpret that and in terms of how the people around you collaborate to help you. Um, there's a sense of being over-involved, okay? I don't want to walk into the clinical site, my, my third levelers, and see y'all sitting on the bed, stroking the patient's hair, you know what I'm saying, hug, all this stuff. You know, before you walk out, everybody knows all their, you know, personal stories. You, you, you've exchanged cell phone numbers. You know, you're, you're Facebooking each other. There, there's a, don't be selfies, you know, in the bed. I don't want to see none of that. Okay? I'm serious. It's a HIPAA violation number one. People go to jail for that. People go to jail for a lot less. But, but if that's not healthy, you don't want to get over involved with your patients because Patient, I don't know, how do I say this? I don't want to say patient style, but you, like, you don't want to take on all of the stress of all of the patients that you deal with because you, that is called burnout. And we need you to stay in nursing for as long as you can. People get burnt out. Babies, they'll burn you out. Okay, that's why I had to take a break. I, well, I took a break, man, about my third year. I went and worked at the post office and occupational health, that was fun. Um, I was a teacher, I was a school nurse for a year in middle school. Now I had to take a break and I'll never go back to that again. <laughs> middle schoolers are crazy. Yes, they, they, are. they are confused. They are just sexually confused. They're just crazy. <laughs> if you have any, I'm crazy for it. Um, yes. That was the mo that was I the, the most fun, scariest, the, the I learned the most in that year than I ever had. That was crazy. Um, okay. <laughs> Test day. Now this is important, and this is, um, uh, for some of you, this may not resonate with you because this is really about the NCLEX, but um, I hope that you will think about this when the time comes, maybe you'll hear it again, and also, um, it's good practice for now. So, before you get ready to take a test, it's probably not in your best interest to have worked a night shift and to come take an exam at eight in the morning. Now I say that, and so, you know, some of y'all are like, of course not, and some of y'all are like, shoot, I'm gonna have to figure something out. Because, but, but you need to, because if you want to be successful, um, your brain needs to be working and it can't be tired. And, and there is such a thing as fatigue, like it's an actual nursing diagnosis, we didn't make it up. Um, so you need to rest well, um, get there early, because there's nothing like coming in, rushing, fumbling, bumbling, you saw me today, it took me 20 minutes just to get myself together up here at least. Um, and you don't need to be 20 minutes into a test still trying to get yourself together. Um, eat, eating is good. Um, complex carbs and protein is best because it takes a while. You all have had nutrition, right? Mm -hmm. It takes a while for it to break down. Um, there's nothing like eating something full of sugar or something with empty calories and then you crash in an hour or two and, and you have no um, energy, no, no um, source of energy going to your brain. Um, you all have taken anatomy and physiology and nutrition. I know we kind of say these things like, Oh, you need to breathe, take deep breaths. I went to, so this is my first year at Penn, right? And I'm like melting down because their expectations are crazy and it's not, you know, my culture. I wasn't, I didn't know what to, I didn't know what to do with them. Um, <laughs> I went to psychological counseling, what is it called? CAPS, 
uh, something or other. It's, from, it's free from the school. I was like, yes, let me get in here and talk to somebody about my problems. I'm having some problems. And the woman was like, I want to teach you some meditation. We're going to deep breathe. And I was like, I'm not coming back because this is a crock. But I was like, I thought I was going to get some, something better, like some strategies, like a checklist, like a piece of paper, even, even offer me some meds so I can say no or yes or something. But she was like, I'm going to teach you how to breathe. Um, and just be one with your breath. And I was like, what? <laughs> but ABCs, that's like intervention number one. Airway, breathing, circulation, like that's really important. Oxygen, like that's the number one thing. It's a real medication. It's real. You need to breathe and you need to eat. Nutrition, we kind of talk about it like it, like it doesn't really exist, but it's, it's important. Physiologically, it's important. Okay, how to be successful in class. So. You need to read, that's number one. Um, <laughs> I love students who are like, I read every day, I read my book, I read my book. You open the book, you can hear it cracking when you hit the creases. They haven't flipped a single page, they don't know where any of the chapters are, they don't have a clue what resources are in the book. They haven't taken the, the first thing I do is look at the table of contents, because I need to know what's going on. I mean, because I need to conceptualize it. I can flip through the book and see a bunch of words that don't mean anything. Um, it's, it's like the basis of outlining. Outlines are good, by the way. Is that up there? Yeah, make an outline. Outlines are good because otherwise you feel like I've got this bowl full of information and I don't know how to make sense of it. And when you outline it, it helps you say, okay, here are the five concepts that I need to know. And here are the five things about each of those concepts I need to know. So now there's 25 things. But then there's five more things about each of these five things so now I'm up to like, what, five times 25 is, so that's a lot of things that I need to know. Oh, but wait, there's some patterns in these things. So um, for each of these five main concepts, the first thing is pretty much the same for all of them. So um, outlining helps you recognize the patterns and then helps you make sense of things. Take notes. <clears throat> Research shows that when you write things down, you remember them better. So wherever I am, I don't care if I am at the, well, I don't care what they're talking about, where I am, I just take notes, I doodle all the time. And I remember stuff, I now, most of the stuff I never go back and look at ever again. But that's okay because it's in my head. Um, take notes, uh, draw pictures, it helps with um, memory. Um, ask why, because if you don't know why something is, right, number one, you're probably not gonna remember it because rote memorization, I mean, like, that stuff is hard. I don't, you know, I didn't do too well in A&P because I, I don't remember things very well. Like, I understand better than I can remember. Um, <clears throat> and the questions that are passing level questions on the NCLEX, they don't, they're not testing if you know the answer. They're testing if you know why that's the answer. That's the, that's the key piece. Um, we're going to talk about the different levels of questions in a minute um, and why you may feel like in the beginning a lot of the questions you're getting in your classes are memorization questions because you got to start from somewhere. However, the NCLEX actually tests you on questions at a higher level than what you may be learning straight out of the box the first semester. Um, so make sure you know why because that's, that's what we really want to know if you know why. Um, write down your questions so you can remember them. Just keep it, if you have a question, something comes up, jot it down. Send it, um, shoot an email to your instructor. Um, ask a question, yes ma'am. You said that the, the, the NCLEX, how do you say it, NCLEX? NCLEX. To see why you got the answer that you got? Is that what you said? Why the answer is the correct one. Okay. Mm -hmm. So for example, you may know that if your two answer choices are to, um, I don't know, Let, let's say one of your answer choices is, is outside of the scope of practice. Um, maybe you get, mm, they will ask it in such a way that, you've got some examples. I'll be better be able to tell you one of the examples. But, um, because, here's the reason why. Many times there will be two seemingly right answers. You always get between yeah. two answers, yeah. right? Yeah. So this is correct. This is the better answer. Yeah. But what makes it the better answer? And if you don't know why it's the better answer, then 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 you're like uh, any, many, mo. 
<laughs> so that's why the why is important. Uh, ask for help early. Please don't wait till week number 10 and a half talking about I need help. Because the only thing I can help you do is be on time and take that final exam. Um, because the, the rest of everything, we've we been there and done that. So um, as soon as you feel like I'm not getting it or I need a little bit of extra help, even if you feel like you've got it, just go. I, I love it when students come to me and they're like, let me tell you what I know. And they just start spitting out information. And I can be like, yes, yes. And, well, no, that ain't quite right. But OK, yes, now that's right, that's right, that's good. If you can teach it to somebody, then that means you know it. Um, yes, if you can teach it to somebody, that means that you, you really know it. Um, minimize distractions. I know you've got a bunch of buddies in here. Um, and buddies are good. Um, yes, but time and place. I got some, I got some ace, some aces, some besties. Um, they used to get me in all kinds of trouble when I was in high school. I was in AP English, and man, my friend, she used to come get me out of class with a fake pass every day at the same time. And I was like, they didn't put me out of school because there's no way that they can know that, you know, of course I don't have to go to the dean's office every day at 10:15 and stay gone the whole period. Um, I barely passed AP English. The 12th grade year was one of my worst years. It was rough. But um, my friend, she used to get me in trouble. And she was smart, and she kept me out of a lot of trouble, too. But the point is, time and place. And those friendships will be there. Um, I got smart because I was still fooling around with her my freshman year in college. I got a full scholarship to Hampton. I lost that scholarship, man. They took that thing right away. The whole thing, I had to move back home with my mom. It was horrible. Um, yeah, because I failed like all my courses because I was fooling around with her my freshman year. I had to ditch her my sophomore year and get it together. And um, that is still my best friend. She's coming up in a couple, in a month, and we're going to a Spurs game. And we're going to sit. Oh, Spurs. I think I'm still in San Antonio. I guess I'm going to see the Sixers. I make sure I'm not like, oh, Spurs, I'm down there. <laughs> um, yeah, so they'll be there. They'll be there. Um, but this program is only, what, a year? Yes. I have four years to learn everything we're trying to teach you in a year, so don't let anybody tell you that you aren't capable of anything. Let me say that again. I have four years to learn everything that we're about to teach you in a year, and you're about to have generally the same responsibilities except for those two bro prohibited acts. Um, so be clear about what you're undertaking and just know it's for a time. It's time limited. Practice every day. Repetition is key. Um, study buddies. Timing is important. Um, you do not want to learn the material with somebody. That's where you teach it to somebody and you test each other. But if you think you're going to sit down with somebody and learn the material with them, what you're going to really do is chitter chat, talk, play, you know, whatever it is. Maybe you get a little bit of studying done, been there, done that. I study by myself. They're like, come to the study group. If I haven't studied, I'm like, no, because that's a waste of my time. Because I don't know it. And I'm just sitting here listening to everybody argue back and forth about what is that's right, if this is right, no, that's the right, no, it's not that. Um, I need to go learn this stuff so I can be like, no, you're wrong. Let me show you where it is in the book. <laughs> <clears throat> what time do we start? An hour ago? You guys doing okay? Yes. No, we didn't Right. Who said that? Breaks up for the week. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it's uh, it, we, we should definitely we should take a break. We should take a break about every hour. But um, let me see where I am here. Who? Um. Yeah, we're about to get into the meat of it, so, and what time are we getting out of here? 11.30. 11.30. Okay, okay, we've got enough time. So here's the thing about breaks. Um, I tried to start on time, and um, so I, need, I would like for you all to be back in your seats when time is ready to start. Um, and, um, of course, if you're not, and we have to prolong it, the only one that's missing out on is y'all, because y'all need the information. I'm getting paid regardless. <laughs> <laughs> so let's be back. Can we take 10 minutes and be back in our seats ready to go at 9.30? Okay, great. Yeah. Because it wasn't growing right. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> 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 huh? You want to sit there? Why do you mean? Oh.